Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'd also like to thank the organizers for allowing me to present to you remotely from another side of the planet. This morning, I'm going to talk about desert locust forecasting and ask the simple question, is it art or is it science? So let's start with the science. That's the easy part. Desert locusts, as most of you realize, are rational, logical beasts. For example, after rainfall, the female lays her eggs in the sandy, uh, moist soil. And once vegetation dries out, adults migrate to other places that are more favorable. In terms of migration, you could say that locusts are the victims of the environment, but in fact, the adults seem to be able to choose what uh, winds they want to travel on and what winds they don't want to travel on. So the purpose of the uh, Desert Locust Information Service is to try to predict this behavior of the locusts. And we focus on four aspects, the presence or absence of locusts, the breeding, and gregorization, and migration. And we're looking at four dimensions of each of these aspects. We're looking at the spatial, the temporal, the scale, and the probability dimensions. So I give you an example. We are uh, trying to forecast where breeding will occur, when, how much, and what is the likelihood. And of course, we have a system to do that in Rome. Uh, it covers the invasion and the frontline um, areas uh, stretching from West Africa to, to India. And this is a huge area, so we do rely on a variety of remote sensing products. And we also rely on a data flow that comes from the field, from the survey and control teams, uh, through the national uh, locus centers, and then on up to Rome in DLIS. And these uh, countries uh, use a variety of uh, very inno innovative and uh, exciting tools, such as the eLocus uh, tablet, for collecting the data and transmitting it in real time to their national center and custom geographic information systems to manage and analyze um, this data. Here in Rome, we too use a custom GIS and then of course we rely on the internet and social media to uh, disseminate um, our predictions and forecasts and early warning. All of this uh, relies on technology. And as you know, technology has evolved tremendously in the last 50 years. For example, it's much easier now to find locusts. We have computational power to analyze um, the data collected during surveys. Uh, we use uh, advances in telecommunications to transmit that data, which used to be sent by letter and then through telex and then by fax and now by email in near real time. Data management has, has made tremendous um, uh, achievements. Uh, we used to plot um, data using colored pencils, tracing paper, and rulers on top of a map. Now we have GPS, we have uh, digital devices, and we have GIS to do that for us. And of course, there's remote sensing where now from outer space we can see the smallest bushes and weddies and buildings in the middle of nowhere. So that's the science of desert locust forecasting, and it involves disciplines such as ecology, entomology, meteorology, biology, botany, and so on. Many disciplines. And that science is quite simple and straightforward if we live in a perfect world. And unfortunately, we don't. And as a result, there's a lot of impediments to this so-called perfect science. Impediments involving technologies, involving sampling, data, and human factors. And I'd like to present to you and explain some of these um, as examples. Let's look at technology, first of all. Here in the top map, you see uh, the rainfall stations that report rainfall. If we were to rely on them to understand where it's rained in the desert, you can see that there's substantial gaps. So we fill those gaps using satellite estimates of rainfall. And that works quite well. However, not all the time. For example, uh, January of this year along the Red Sea coast, those estimates indicated that light rainfall fell on the northern coastal plains. However, there is no rainfall that fell on the central and southern coastal plains. But in reality, this was not true. Based on the survey data from teams on the ground, it did rain in those areas. So if we rely solely on those estimates, we would have missed a lot of important rainfall. Similarly, we use modus imagery to help us understand where vegetation is becoming green in the desert. And there have been some studies suggesting that up to 36% of the green vegetation is being missed by modus. So this 
imperfect technology obviously has great impacts on the precision of our forecasting and predictions. Looking at the survey coverage that's undertaken by the national survey and control teams in the countries, there is incomplete coverage both over time and space. Surveys are not conducted every day of the month, for example. So those days where there's no surveys, we have less of a good idea of what's going on in, in, in the desert locust areas. Similarly, surveys don't cover all areas within the country and may miss important green areas where there might be locust presence and breeding and increasing in numbers. So these gaps obviously impact again the precision of desert locust forecasting. This is further compounded by an increasing number of areas that simply cannot be entered by national teams. Libya, Northern Malia, Western Sahara, Darfur, Somalia, parts of Yemen, or other areas where the security is not very stable and so teams must be uh, escorted by the military. So these two issues uh, that deal with insecurity obviously impact the quality of the data and the coverage. Furthermore, some surveys, uh, the results of the surveys, may not accurately um, be uh, indicative of the current situation. For example, in the first month, surveys might find only a few uh, locusts present, but then suddenly the next month there are much larger infestations present. So perhaps during that first month, the, the, the sampling uh, was uh, not really uh, reflective of the reality of the situation in the field. So this is something else that we must contend with when we're forecasting locusts. And of course, it's not simple as whenever there's fantastically good rains or great ecological conditions in the desert, there's going to be locust populations increasing. This often is not the case. They don't respond to uh, good conditions all the time. And in some years when the conditions are only average, they might respond very well. So we have to take this into consideration when we're um, doing our predictions and forecasts. We're very uh, cognizant of the uh, quality and the timeliness of the data that is being collected and reported. Um, obviously, if the data is high quality, then uh, that will affect the precision of our um, forecast. If it's poor quality, again, that affects it, but in a negative way. The reporting quality and the timeliness um, undoubtedly fluctuates um, over time and from country to country. And in addition, we use uh, two types of models to help us analyze the data and make our predictions. We use a breeding model and we use a trajectory model. And we have to be very careful in use of these models, especially the trajectory model, where it could give us the wrong answers. For example, on the left-hand side, um, the, the model is showing that if locusts were in central Sudan at the end of the summer, uh, then they would move to Central African Republic and Cameroon, where in reality we know, in fact, that they move in the opposite direction to the Red Sea coastal plains. Similarly, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we had reports of swarms this January on the Red Sea coast of uh, Saudi Arabia. And if we put that information into the trajectory model, it uh, estimates that those swarms came from Libya or for Yemen where in fact there is no locust present in those two countries. So we have to be very careful in the use of uh, models and use them with um, some sense. And as we know, we are now being bombarded um, in the social media by an increasing amount of fake news. And This is another uh, instance uh, that can cause confusion to locust situations. For example, in January, a social media reported swarms of locusts um, arriving in Mecca. And in fact, those weren't locusts. They were crickets. Uh, after a press release issued by DLIS uh, in February, uh, the media picked it up and exaggerated and embellished it, saying it was the end of the world, there's going to be a biblical plague, and so on and so forth. So uh, those of you who, who uh, rely on the social media for news or for reporting, um, this can be very misleading. During increased uh, periods of locusts, especially outbreaks, upsurges, and plagues, politics and national pride come into play, and this can affect the quality of the data. So this is another instance that we have to be extremely um, careful about uh, when uh, using this data for predictions and warnings. 
So that's the science, and those are the impediments. So that means there are some serious gaps then that we have to deal with. And we deal with that in what I would um, uh, submit as art. And this would be the art of forecasting. And this entails a familiarity with habitat, data, and people. And it involves experience, intuition, and feelings. It might sound a bit strange, but let me try to explain this to you. First of all, it's very important to know your backyard, to visually have been able to see as many places as possible of where the locusts might be present, the breeding areas, important um, breeding areas. And I've been lucky, I've been working in this um, area now for, for more than 30 years, and I've been out um, during the past three decades accompanying national survey and control teams in the, these uh, habitats of desert locusts. So I've seen them for myself with my own eyes. And I'm very fortunate because those places that I have been, um, and then I get data, and we receive data from those places, it's much easier for me to understand that data and to use it for analysis and better predictions. Uh, honestly, those places, those few places I haven't been to, I must say it's a bit harder for me to, to um, understand that data. And when we're talking about the data, we use a lot of data in DLIS. It's coming from different sources. And um, over time, when you use this data day in and day out, you start to become very familiar with it. You start to understand its strengths, its weaknesses, how reliable it is. There's very small nuances in the data. And of course, there's huge gaps in the data. But the more familiar you are with the data, then the better you can use it uh, to hopefully make more precise um, predictions. And in this age of technology and innovation, we can never forget the importance of the human factor. Humans. This is what drives the system. And it's very important, uh, if you want to have good data, you have to build up trust with those people who are collecting and using the data. So this demands good personal relations. And again, this can be achieved um, very well over time, but it does take time. And I'm lucky again in this area in the sense that I've been working a long time, so I know practically everyone in these countries who are collecting the data and using it. And lastly, I think it's um, very important to think like a locust. Because if you think like a locust, then you have a much, uh, perhaps, a better idea of, of what uh, may happen um, in the future. And that can be built into the forecast, into the predictions and early warnings. So lastly, before I finish, let me try to give you four examples of what I call intuition, experience, and using feelings to help fill in those gaps that we've identified. And I'll start with the first one in the top left um, corner. And in 2004, as you remember, there is very heavy um, spring breeding in northwest Africa. Very intensive um, ground and aerial control operations were being uh, undertaken by those countries who were reporting that uh, they were making very good progress um, at stopping um, any type of uh, further migration. However, I was forecasting at that same time that there indeed would be a migration from those areas that were uh, not treated or not detected to the Northern Sahel for the summer. So I, my forecasts, in fact, were going against, they were contradicting the national reports that we were receiving from the countries, from the data. So this was my intuition, my, my feeling, my experience, and indeed uh, there was an invasion of the Sahel in the summertime. Uh, let me go to the next example uh, in the bottom uh, left corner. Uh, this was in Yemen, and it occurred at the beginning of the summer when the winds are traditionally uh, uh, moving from the northeast uh, Horn of Africa uh, across the Indian Ocean to Pakistan and India. And in Yemen, we knew that there was uh, some locust activity, but we had actually no information, no data to confirm that. So I made a prediction that some swarms would form and move on those winds to Pakistan and India. And indeed, that happened. So here's a case where I had an intuition or feeling that something was going on, but no concrete data to back that up. The third example is on the top uh, right corner is, as I mentioned before, if we just rely on models, and those models can give us the wrong answer, so we have to rely more on our experience and our intuition and our, our feeling to uh, make better predictions of uh, locust migration. 
And the last example, the bottom right um, corner, is a delayed response. And here, uh, often we can have cyclones that produce very heavy rainfall in good conditions uh, that can allow uh, several generations of breeding, but there's no confirmation of any locust activity in these um, areas. So I maintain a forecast often for, for five or six months uh, saying that the locusts are breeding, they're gregorizing, uh, there's possibility of forming swarms, and then once the vegetation dries out, uh, those locusts will move out into other areas. And the recent example, of course, was last year when we had a cyclone um, in the Arabian Peninsula in May and then again in October, and then in January of this year, swarms that uh, formed in those areas invaded uh, the interior of Saudi Arabia. So with that, I've come to the end of my short presentation. And uh, I think uh, the answer to the question, is desert locusts forecasting art or science? Well, I'll let you be the judge. Thank you very much.